mission. Here we go. All right, guess where we are? And look who else is here. Hmm, I wonder why. Okay, so uh, Lucas and I are, are outside the shop and we are um, socially distant. We measured it. Um, and uh, I asked him to say a few words and uh, I first wanted him to explain um, as simply as he could what folding at home means from a science perspective. So uh, a lot of diseases or like the viruses, like the coronavirus we have, they operate in certain ways. It's like the coronavirus interacts with your body in a certain way. And if we can figure out how that works, we can then do things to like stop it from interacting in that way and maybe have it have less effects or completely stop it. But we don't know, we can't just look and see what it does. So we have to use these complex computer programs to model what it does. And those are really like computer intensive. So what Folding at Home does is it splits it up into jobs and sends it to every participating computer, which can then do the math and then send it back and basically help these scientists get these models, which they can use to then cure the disease users. And we're on a mission. And Lucas is hard at work. And what he's trying to do is set the IP address of the server so that we can use it outside of the school walls so people will be able to log into it from home. That's the mission. And so he's looked up, tried to figure out how to do it, and um, he is he's actually doing the work as we speak. Can you give us a status on how we're doing? Uh, adding the IP right now, just all the information we were told to set it up with. Things looking good? Yep. Cool. Sure. Are you going to check it on this to see if it's there? Yeah. I'm oh, cool. Make sure I don't take away performance as well. So kind of, uh, Look good? Lucas designed and built his own PC at his house while we've been locked up and he made a connection with this organization and he is already top four percent top four percent yeah of points in the last two days. here say it again say i am off. now top four percent of points uh, in terms of everyone that's ever done it can you tell us what points mean uh you get points for every workload that you fold so the server gives you stuff to fold and then you fold it and send it back and you get points based on like complexity and how much you've done and so i've already got a lot of points because i got the power for it Cool. So in this machine that he made, he's in the top 4% 4, 4 of people that are uh, contributing to this activity. So now what's happening is he's going to use the server to be able to do this also. And uh, Lucas, what did you say the relationship was power-wise between your machine that you made in the ho your home and the server, roughly? Uh, i got to say about a fourth. A fourth. Okay, so the server is four times more power, nothing against his new machine at home, but the server is, is roughly four times more powerful than it. So if imagine him hooking that up to this uh, organization, then we should be able to really uh, make a contribution. So that's what Lucas um, is doing here. But it needed to be on the internet first. And so uh, he did successfully um, Find the change the IP address, and the ETIS guy from Glendale uh, just pinged the machine, so we successfully have communication from the outside. Um, and I believe that um, Lucas just pinged his machine at his house, too. Did you just do that? What did I do? Yeah, I, actually, I pinged, I pinged my my server at home. Okay, you pinged your server at home. So now this server can see outside the walls of the school, which was a prerequisite to us being able to do this folded home thing. All right, tell us what's happening. So we got we got a job here. Um, we're running project uh, 13862. We are 7% done with whatever workload we just got. So it's doing all these steps right now and it's doing all the, 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 the calculations and like the chemistry or whatever. And then once this is done, it'll send all, all of its data back and then we'll get some points from it. Cool. 
And then if we want to do another job, like do you need to do like no, what you did again or does it automatically find another job? Once it's done, it'll pack up the data, it sends it over and then it will wait and it will request a new one and then it'll get a new one and it will just keep um, doing jobs. So this thing is sitting here, a workhorse, just waiting to crunch and it'll keep doing as, as long as there's jobs to do. Yeah, pretty much. All right, cool. All right, go ahead. Tell us so there. yeah, we're using all of the power. All 24 cores are maxed out right now. And we're pulling, yeah, 24,000% CPU usage. It's pretty great, great. Cool. Um, you know, it can be up, up to like two hours before getting okay. points. I know on mine I'll get a, a bunch of points every couple hours. Ah. And I think I pull around a million a day. Po a million points? Yeah, I think that was the, the average. I forget. It tells me, but I haven't. I don't remember the exact. And about how long have you been, pull, you know, to get you this, be in this 4% category? How long have you, roughly, how long have you been doing it? Two days now. Two? I believe so, since what, Wednesday maybe, maybe. Wow. So you are a power horse compared to the see. rest of the country. Is this worldwide? Yeah. Hi, everybody. So we're going to talk a little bit about components in Unity. And before I do much on that front, I want to do a little bit of review. So I opened up my first folder and notice I have a few JPEGs. I have a prefab and I have a couple scene icons. They look like Unity icons. They're scenes. So I'm going to double click on one called grav.unity. I think it's the last thing I saved when we were together last. And that's going to open Unity up and it's going to put us right where we were when we left last time, which I think was talking about um, putting a rigid body component into our object. So I want to do a little bit of review. This is a hierarchy over here, and these are a list of the game objects. And if I click on this little triangle here, um, all it does is hide the game objects that are in this scene. So this is one scene. Um, I could highlight a game object. If I click on the main camera, I can see uh, the details over here for the camera. And notice something just moved so that the field of view of the camera changed. And then if I click on Fred, I can see that Fred is within the field. And if I either click on game here, or I leave it on scene and I press this play button, I can see Basically, it's called the movie, and I can see what my movie looks like. So we got to have a camera because that's the, the field that we look at. Now, if I take my fingers and do like this on the mouse pad, I can adjust the size of the camera. So if we click on the camera and I do what I just showed you very carefully, I can zoom in and out and control what part of that rectangle I see. And, and so you can adjust that as you like. Um, I'm also going to show you what happens if we take Fred and drag Fred out of the field of view of the camera. And if I go press play now, I have a groovy movie that has nothing in it because Fred is way off to the left. Okay, so that's what this white border is. It's the field of view of your camera. So I'm gonna put Fred in it. Um, remember that this panel over here on the right, I just highlighted Fred. This panel here is telling me everything about Fred. It's called the inspector. And the reason that Fred moves is because it has a rigid body component, which we gave last time. And what we're gonna to do today is talk about a collider component. And so I'm gonna add a new object. I'm gonna get a buffoon, which looks a lot like a Fred. And I'm gonna drop that into my field of view. And I'm gonna go over to the, the hierarchy and I'm gonna rename it. I'm going to call it ground. So this is what we're going to bounce off of. 
and then I'm going to change the shape of it. And I'm doing it by dragging. There's different ways of doing it. I'm just dragging it. I have this guy selected on this choice here of how to manipulate the game object. And so I can do that. And so I'm just making a real thin strip here. That's the ground. Okay, and so now I'm gonna add a component to the ground called a collider component. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna say add component. I'm gonna to go to physics 2D and I'm gonna to go to box collider. This is like putting a bumper around the whole thing. And so now this object has that and this little triangle here, I can toggle this. If I click it, it folds up all those details about the collider and I can see more easily and over here in the inspector what all the components are that the ground object has. Now, if I hit play, we should see Fred fall. And then the question is, what happens when it gets to the ground? And what ha happens is it falls right through it, which was sort of a bummer for Fred. So now what I have to do, if I want him to bounce off each other, I got to go back to Fred. So I'm going to select Fred. Notice it's selected over here. And I'm going to go and I'm going to add a component, a box collider component to Fred also. So we're going to go here. We're going to say 2D physics. And we're going to say box collider. And so now Fred has two components that I've added to it. One is rigid body and one's box collider and ground has one component that I've added, which is box collider. So now if the two objects crash into each other, they both have colliders, they will stop. Boom. Okay. Now we can get a little more fancy here. We're going to make the separation a little bit bigger. Woohoo. And we are also, note that whatever I click is what takes over the inspector area. Now I'm gonna, right now I've got Fred and I'm gonna talk about the Z axis for a second. So this is the X axis. Everyone should be familiar with that. That's math class. Here's the Y axis, just like math class. And Z actually comes out of the page. So if I were to rotate the photo about Z, it would spin, in fact, I'll do it. So I'm gonna go over to rotation and I'm gonna go over to Z and I'm gonna type in here 45. And if I do that, you see that Fred rotates about a line perpendicular to the plane of the camera. And so now if I hit play, and I see this thing come down. When it hits the ground, we see a little more physics. And that's the beautiful part of Unity. All that stuff, that all that time you have to wait when it like boots up and when you're starting a new project and it, there's a little while while those fold, folders are being made, all those things are features that you can take advantage of if you'd like, uh, that you can add to your game objects. So having the physics there, we use it via components that we add to our game object and then we can take advantage of it. Um, notice we haven't written any code so far. So that's an important point. Um, that, and and it'll, we're gonna go on a little bit longer without that and then we'll add that to our bag of tricks and then we'll be able to make things move either by physics that are built in or uh, controlling the object with equations, which is what we've done in other labs, like when we made the car drive across the screen with Java, and we made like the sunrise and set with Python. So we know how to make things move with code and we'll fold that into Unity. So now uh, I want to tell you what the lab is so you can practice this stuff. 
if we go into the Unity curriculum and we go into the folder called Collider Component and we open up that PowerPoint, most of the Unity labs have the labs, uh, most of the Unity PowerPoints have the labs at the end, the PowerPoints. So here's the lab. You're gonna make like a pinball machine where these blue things are uh, solid, they're, they're fi in fixed positions, and then you're gonna have an object uh, that's at an angle and um, it should fall down and then bounce off these and then bounce and then bounce and then bounce and then fall down. Yeah, and then uh, same deal as normal. Uh, hit a print screen when the ball's somewhere bouncing through the middle of the, the path and uh, submit that to the Edmodo Blast that I'm going to put out for for the Collider lab. Hi, hey, hey, we're still finding our way on the vlogs uh, episodes, but I think I I think one thing that's starting to gel is I think I want to have a little coach session at the beginning of each AP segment um, to mostly help you out with the, the AP test or announcements or answers to questions, things like that. So this is the first uh, crack at that. Um, so the first thing is uh, Professor Vahe in first period, Super AP, uh, he's done a lot of teaching to that class. Uh, he's now going to go broader and he's going to have his own YouTube channel and uh, he'll be answering questions. He'll have his own episodes that are answering questions and his first one is going to be a solution to the practice problem that I assigned on April 1st. It was a practice AP test that had a ray list, a uh, free response question that had a ray list in it. So I'll let you know when that's up and running. Second thing, a plug for Discord. I'd like it to be sort of like uh, how the back of the room works when we were in normal session where the super APs are back there and you can get up at any time and go ask a question. So getting an account on Discord and trying to feel comfortable with that. Um, there's a lot of super APs that are online a, a lot of the time and there's APs there too. So if you can get used to going there when you're stuck to get questions answered, that would be really good. I'm going to be there every Friday at noon, which are sort of like office hours, but I'm there a lot more than that. I'm on there every day for some chunk of time. So hopefully you'll be able to find people when you get stuck. Um, also questions um, or comments. I've noticed they show up on Edmodo. They show up on the website. Um, so I'm going to try to use this segment here to answer some of those questions. Um, and I, I'll try to do a better job at that. There's a little bit of a time delay, but um, yeah. So one comment was made by Caitlin on the homework, uh, re remote homework number two. And she was asking about why the method returned a Boolean and it doesn't, it shouldn't, it should be a void method. So nice job, Caitlin. Um, somebody else asked about uh, or had trouble compiling because of different versions of Java. And what I do to fix that is um, I edited my c.bat so it has this line in it. So that solved the problem for me. Hopefully, if you're having trouble at home with that, it helps you too. And then the next one, Danny made a comment, which turned out to be pretty involved in the solution. So I've got another segment that's going to answer it. And this gets pretty into the nitty gritty. It might be a little intimidating. Uh, for some of you. So if it is, just ignore it. Um, but hopefully it'll shed some light on uh, what Danny was asking. Danny made a comment somewhere about for each loops referring to a comment that I had made that you don't want to use them uh, because it, uh, when you're going to change something because it makes a copy of them of each object and and then there's a for each loop inside of one of the pixel labs so it was a really insightful thing to to ask about so i want to talk about that for a second so i made it a, a simple program here uh, and i'm going to go sort of fast so don't forget that you can hit pause 
but I basically made an array of integers. I printed them, and then I printed them with an, a traditional for loop here. I'm oh, sorry, I changed them to, I set it to zero, and then I printed them again. So the output of this is, this can go over right here like that. And I think you can see them both. Yeah, so the output here is, there's the original array from the print statement on line eight. And here's the array after this for loop is run. Okay, so obviously it changed. And then here's the for uh, loop uh, used, the for each loop used. Um, so I, I compiled and ran it. <clears throat> and when you see in this case, the original array remains the same. And what's happening is in the for each loop, when we set this variable e equal to zero, it's just that integer e. It's not referring back to the uh, to this guy, each of these. So I've jumped here to the picture code and I'm inside the picture tester file and I put a new method in. So the upper method here, zero blue, is the one that was there already. And this one, in fact, works, which was Danny's point. Um, why does it work if I said um, it shouldn't with the for each loop? But in this case, pixel obj is referring to each pixel in the array. And it's the address of where it is. So then if we say, hey, the pixel object that's there, let's turn it um, the blue, it's blue value zero, that works. If in contrast, we try, and I made this method up, zero, zero. So everything's the same, except instead of saying, I'm gonna turn the object to color, I set the, ob the pixel object to null, like I'm trying to get rid of it. And in this case, this is the address of where it is. It's not the actual pixel object. So when after this code runs, the picture itself doesn't change. It did not have any effect on the because it's just turning the, the address of where the pixel object is to null. So what's the best? This is probably way too confusing, but the the summary is if you're using a for each loop, it's safest to use it if you're like printing an a collection of things, traversing a, a, an array or a, a array list of something. And if you want to remove an object from an array, um, use a traditional for loop uh, where you're uh, indexing each value. And I encourage you to practice, uh, do some tests. If, you're, if you want to check that we're really down deep here. And if you want to chase this some more, um, write some code like what I did and, and play around with it and, until you're comfortable. Hi, everybody. We're gonna talk about the uh, remote homework assignment number one. And uh, that's fine, don't worry. Hi, everybody. We're gonna talk about the remote homework assignment uh, number one. And this had to do with the binary search. And if you remember, it's when in class we had like a book and I said, okay, somebody demonstrated it and you took it and we're looking for page 589 and we would open it up and take half. And uh, oh, by the way, I'm using my, my high school junior high yearbook. Look at that year, right after the pilgrim showed up. And oh, my first split right on my page. Oof, that's me in like, seventh grade or something. Whoa. And I'm wearing a tie. I hate ties. Who cares? Um, so yeah. So now we're gonna, we're gonna look at some solutions from you guys. Uh, here's the first one. Um, notice the, the variable names. Uh, so we've got an array called barf. Uh, that's egg long. And um, the reason I'm showing this one is because it's an example of not a binary search. So remember that in order 
for a binary search to work, the list has to be in order. And what this person did was they took in a, an array that was full of random numbers and they went through it in order and looked to see if they found it. And if they found it, they would return the index, which is what it was supposed to do. The problem is with this one, the, the worst case number of steps that it would take to find the thing is n or however many elements because we need to assume it's the last one and that's no good that's uh, too long the next uh answer i want to share with you uses an iterative binary search algorithm so you can see there's a while loop here um, and this the, the way this works is uh it goes and finds the middle the middle index and then checks to see if that one is well you can read it so hit pause but this is a very nice clean solution to the iterative solution and it works and then here's a solution to the recursive binary search algorithm and there was some discussion about the parameter list and whether it could be done um, with what i gave you and the answer is yes it could be um, but also you could change it if you wanted to. So I was okay with that, but I'm sharing a solution that works that kept the same parameter list for both iterative and recursive. So in this case, all the stuff I'm highlighting is the base case. Okay, so all that stuff, if you found it, if the list size went to zero, if it wasn't there, if it was there, if it was in the middle, that's all those if statements. And remember, you can hit pause. So I'm not gonna dwell on this long. My goal now is to make your segments shorter because we can take advantage of the pause. Uh, and then the part I'm highlighting now is the recursive part. And you can see it's the else if you didn't find it when it was in the middle position. And then what you have to do is call a binary search again with either the upper half of the array. And this person used a groovy method, which I'd never done before, but I just assumed by the name of it that it grabbed the, uh, took the original array and, and went between these two indices and made a new array, a copy of it. And then if it's in the bottom half, it goes and uh, grabs the bottom half of the array. And yeah, pay attention to this down here. This is probably the explanation for why uh, the parameter list was able to stay the same. But this one uh, also tested, uh, well, I tested. Okay, and this is the last one I wanted to share. And I'm not, we're not gonna look at this person's search algorithm, but I liked how they tested, okay? so. Testing is so important relative to understanding being good, good coders. And so this person, you can see they made an array that was already sorted. Okay, nice. That wasn't what this was about. So why call sorts and stuff? Just make the array originally in order. And then they um, called their search algorithm with that array. And then they picked a bunch of values here that were at the boundaries inside of it and not inside of it. And then you can see here all of the output values um, according to that. So I like this in terms of a testing approach. Hi, APs. Uh, I want to go over an assignment, show you a couple of examples of uh, your fellow student solutions to these. Um, and yeah, so here we go. This was the question about, um, what was it? It was a matrix and you had to fill it with ones and zeros and make it like framed. And, and so the first one I want to show you uh, is Kevin's from period four. And he noticed something interesting that nobody else did. And that is, uh, this is, Asking to make the framed picture with the matrix doesn't make a lot of sense if the number of rows or the number of columns is less than three because then you can't have any kind of a frame. So he he did a smart thing here and had the, the person have to keep entering values until 
um, they got a value of three or greater for both the row and the column. That was a good thing. The thing that wasn't so good, no offense, Kevin, is he never used his matrix. Like he did all this work to get uh, the column and the value number, but he never made a matrix and he never used it, which was the thing I was going after. He had all his, and, and a nested for loop is, is instrumental to this. Remember, you're like mowing a lawn. So you have to go to each row and visit each column. And, and so, yeah, uh, you need to do that, which he did, but he outputted just SOP things. So there never was a matrix in his solution. The next one I want to show you, I believe, was Freddy's from period three. Thank you, Freddy. So he did make a matrix, and he's doing it right here. And he made a print method, which I think is great. The thing that I would do differently from what he did do is inside his print method, he, and you can see over here, he his output is groovy. There it is. Yay. But the thing that I would do differently is the, the print method couples together both making the matrix and printing it. And it'd be better if those were decoupled. It would be better if in the PSVM, he may, he filled the matrix up with ones and zeros. And uh, in the uh, print method, he printed it. But he also did the same thing as Kevin, where he didn't actually load up the matrix. He, he system dot out printed zeros or ones at the appropriate time. And the intent I had on this um, assignment was for you to load the matrix up with ones and zeros and then print out the matrix. The next one I want to look at is Elisha's, I believe. And uh, he got the row and column value as he was supposed to. He constructed the matrix. That's great. And then he has his nested for loop. Um, and he, uh, he fills up his matrix appropriately. Like he has if statements on, if you're on the edge, he's putting zeros in. Anything else you're putting in the center. So he's actually doing what I've been saying about loading up the actual matrix with values. And then he also has a print method, which Freddie did, but as I said, he coupled the two jobs. He put, Freddie put this part and the actual printing into the same print method. Whereas with Elisha, he has a, a matrix called print. It takes in a matrix, whatever the matrix is, stuff, uh, prints it out. So that was really nice. And then I wanted to show one more. Matthew period six, and I'm showing this just because it's got sort of a finesse, super AP flair to it. So he does everything he's supposed to. He gets the row and column values. He constructs the matrix right here. And then what he does is he takes advantage of the fact that the matrix, when it's constructed on the line that I highlighted, actually loads the matrix up with zeros like Java does that for you. And so he, in his nested for loop, the only thing he has to do is lay the ones in. And he does that uh, just in the place we need the ones, which is one in from the side and one in from the other side. And similarly with the column boundaries, he leaves out the perimeter basically, and he loads up the center ones with ones. And then he's got a groovy print method just like Elisha did. He uses a for each loop. Um, and so that's cool. Uh, yeah. So, and I think I can show you, and there's his output. So four different solutions to this problem. Um, about half of you did like uh, Kevin and Freddie, where you didn't load up the matrix. So I would go back and do that. Uh, look at the, you know, Revisit the problem because that was the real intent was a, a simple manipulation of a two dimensional array. I'd like to make a few comments on the first part of the episode where we, that's a peacock, by the way, where we uh, listen to Lucas and talk about 
uh, folding at home and applying his skill set to solving that problem. Lucas is an example of somebody who was bursting with passion. Everything we saw him do was on his own initiative. He wasn't doing that for credit. I didn't ask him to do it. It was him pursuing something he loved and applying it to a problem that the world needs right now. And that was just, that's just beautiful. And I was thinking, if I still worked at JPL right now, I would hire him in a second. Yeah, so guys, if you've got spare CPU um, use and you're not using your computers, look at the, the Dr. Nito Discord. Um, I've posted an announcement there that will show you how to get set up. And if you want, you can also message me on Discord and I can help walk you through that same process. And then we can get you set up and getting points for our CB team. Very good. Thank you, Lucas.